why am I, why am I talking about this region? Uh, I thought it, it could be interesting to give a little bit of an insight from, from a project which, which I was running when I was in, in Bonn, as Uri explained, at the Center for Development Research um, on land and water use in Uzbekistan. <coughs> and actually, we, we called this project originally Economic and Ecological Restructuring of Land and Water Use in Irrigated Areas in Uzbekistan. Later, we found out that was a very long title, and uh, at one point, I was carrying a big plexiglass sign for our new building that says German Uzbek Landscape Project. And so I thought, while well, well, we are having all these landscape discussions here in C4, uh, it might be useful to, to get an insight from a project that was running for 10 years in that region with, with the funding from the German Ministry of Education and Research, um, and uh, which I was heading mostly from Bonn uh, why my colleague John Lamas uh, was the person who was mostly running the show in, in Uzbekistan. So it was a large project. Uh, we had about 1 million euro funding per, per year, which was good to have in that region. And we looked at, um, so as I said, we looked at land and water use in the context of the Aral, or in the, in the Aral Sea Basin. The Aral Sea, as you may know, was once the fourth largest sweetwater lake in the world. And it has been disappearing over the last 40, 50 years. So now we have 10% uh, of the original size left, both in volume and in, in surface. So basically, a, a very huge lake had, has disappeared. And, and why? Because um, in the Soviet Union, there was a huge expansion of irrigated area, areas in that region, because that region was basically the, the region where cotton was produced as a strategic good. And cotton needs uh, warm days, and uh, uh, so that was a, uh, that's actually the northernmost region where you can grow cotton, and uh, so it was it was very important for the Soviet Union to have that. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, the countries actually continued doing this, and uh, Uzbekistan is nowadays the um, uh, the sixth largest cotton producer in the world and the second largest cotton exporter in the world. So still, cotton production continues, and um, it's, it's very dominant together nowadays with wheat. And it's happening in, in, in irrigated areas that, that increase from 2 million hectares to, to 8 million hectares over the course of 60 years. So all that water that's, that originally was going into the LC is now going into these irrigated areas and then flowing somewhere else or disappearing into the atmosphere. And uh, there are a lot of ecological problems and, and livelihood problem, problems. And uh, of course, international, the international debate was in the beginning, oh, can we fill this Aral Sea? Can, can, can we get it back? There was a lot of diversity, fish production, and so on. And uh, in that project, we, we did once, we did modeling, uh, a modeling exercise to see whether it could actually be done. And we found that you could only do it, you could only refill the lake if you were sending all these 40 million people that are now living in that region away. So 30 million of these are rural, and a third of these rural people are living in a, in a very high poverty. So basically, our project was not looking at the RLC. It was looking at how to improve uh, livelihoods in that region and at the same time look at, at uh, more e ecological, more sustainable resource use. Um, um, so what we did is actually have, we, we tried to, to, to develop an integrated approach on, on, on uh, Basically, starting with technical issues, how to improve land use, how to improve water use, how to, how to bring in different crops that diversify a bit from the cotton wheat, uh, almost monoculture, and um, how to bring in crops that, that could be used on very degraded land. When you irrigate a lot, then you, you create basically a sec what's called secondary soil salinity. You have a very high salinity in the, in the region, and that is ultimately affecting crop production. So you need to uh, reduce irrigation, and um, and so we were looking into that. We were looking into institutions that, that are governing uh, uh, irrigation. We were looking into into technologies and e economics around those technologies. We were, for example, we were trying to introduce trees in uh, or agroforestry in marginal lands, which means lands that were actually used for cotton but were very very salinized and could only produce very low amounts of cotton with very high uh, very high inputs. And um, so we looked at what, we selected local trees, we looked at 
what, uh, what species would grow best. We try to, to develop the whole economics of the, of the tree production. We found basically that if a farmer had the possibility to, to wait for, for seven to 10 years until he can harvest the tree, he would have a much better income than from the cotton, for example. Um, so um, we, we try to, de to develop these things um, in, in, a, in, a, in an interdisciplinary way. And, and on the way, we, we actually managed to, um, to debunk a few myths about, about the region. It's, it's interesting how such regions that, that create a lot of interest internationally uh, create also a lot of myth building, the misconceptions that, that, uh, that are widely dissipated in the media. Like uh, for Central Asia, one of the things, uh, actually that's the article that was sent around together with the invitation that's just coming out in a nice book by Michigan State University, <coughs> um, where we try to look at those myths. For example, people think there is a huge water scarcity in the region. Well, it's a dry region, it's, it's mostly deserts, but there is a lot of water. It's just being overused. Uh, people think farmers don't know how to irrigate. The farmers are kind of ignorant. They don't know that lots of water brings a lot of salinity, so they're spoiling their land and they don't know it. Actually, we found out by doing a lot of work with, directly with farmers that farmers know very well what's going on, but they have other pressures they, rea they react to, and, and land degradation is not their biggest pressure. It's, a, it's a, an important f point for us. We look at this as, as foreigners, uh, but they have different problems because they operate under what's called a state order on, uh, on crops like cotton and wheat. The government is actually uh, controlling very much the, 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 the production of cotton and the production of wheat because these are crops that are strategic important. The cotton importance. The cotton gives the revenues, the international revenues, and so the, cotton, the farmers get paid for raw cotton basically below, way below world market price. Uh, and then the government um, sells the, 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 the cotton in internationally, at, of course, at world market price. So many people see that as, a, as an exploration of farmers. But what people don't see is that the system also provides a lot of uh, subsidies at, at, or inputs at subsidized price. Uh, fertilizers, actually the whole water supply system is for free right now. Uh, and uh, so all these subsidies are coming in for farmers and actually make the balance a little bit different. And in drought years, for example, it's farmers that have run up huge debts. Sometimes uh, th these debts were just written, written off at the end of the year in this system. So there's a lot of pros and cons to be said about, about such a system. And um, uh, so these are some of the things we try to correct. And I think it was interesting to see that if you, if you spend a lot of time in the region, you can see a lot of things going on behind the scenes that, that are much, you, know, you get a much deeper understanding of what's going on than what's on the surface. And um, <clears throat> so I said landscape approach. I, so the question is what, what came out of such a project? Um, in one dimension, we had a, we had, we had a lot of scientific production. We, we produced several hundred papers and, and, and PhD studies, MSc studies, and, and books on, on this, uh, on, on the experience from this work, and it's still not finished. There's still work that, can be, that needs to be published, and, and so we, we're still working on this. We had some 40 PhD students in the course of 10 years. We had some 100 master students, many from Uzbekistan, and they have moved on. They, they gained uh, experience in, on the international arena, and, and some have, some continue working in the country, some have begun to work, World Bank, to research institutions abroad, and so on. So this is a success already. But of course, you would like to see a success in the land management uh, that we actually target, targeted when we set up the, the project. And um, so what we found out that this, this integrated approach, which we tried to do, we look at economics, look at technologies in, in a context, um, it was not something we could we could easily sell to, to the local authorities or also to local farmers. So what we could do is develop these ideas, you know, is, is it feasible to, to, to grow trees? Is it feasible to have conservation agriculture? Is it feasible to, um, to diversify your, your crop portfolio? And then go out with simple solutions and try to implement those simple solutions. So we, we knew that conservation agriculture was working, which is basically a way of reducing 
uh, machinery input uh, and and and, uh, and and reducing the traffic on on the fields and so on, reducing the inputs. And so uh, how we how we how do we get this out? And there was one student in the in the project who was actually a farmer's son, and he took this up. He he made his PhD in this, and uh, a very smart guy. He became a consultant on this, and he's now running around in that region and actually bringing out this technology to farmers. Uh, one of the, the diversification ideas we had was to bring in indigo, which is a, a cash crop. And so we could show that this could successfully be, be grown and actually produce, uh, indigo could be produced as a, as a product to be sold, which is, has a very, very high value. And um, so now there is a farmer association uh, around the indigo, indigo production. We ourselves set up a, an NGO of scientists, or they, actually they set them up, they set it up themselves to, to be able to, to continue with the research after the project was over at the university and, and actually generate more funds for, for research. So these things are actually, um, and this is actually my, my message uh, from, from this whole talk. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to develop integrated approaches, you have to find a way of bringing them back to the people where they can actually uh, use them and digest them. We knew that the, 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 the state system would, would not be able to digest inter integrated approaches. We knew that they had an entry point for alternative technology, uh, technologies in the Ministry of Agriculture and Water Resources. So we submitted all, all these technologies as suggestions to the ministry for them to, to, to test them and to, to try them out. So, but basically we, went, we took it all back to simple technologies, tree growing, conservation agriculture, uh, indigo and stuff like that. So really simple things. We didn't talk about integrated approaches, we didn't talk about you know, something that sounded really complex and convoluted to them. And so I think that's, that's one thing I, uh, I think needs to be done, it's, it's try to find you develop all this research around, the, uh, uh, around the, uh, a complex of questions, and then you try to break it down into manageable, simple solutions that, that people can work with. And the second thing is, of course, as, as I mentioned, we had these, these farmer associations and, 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 and the young student and so on, so we, you need some, some champions uh, to, to run this when, when you're out. We were there for 10 years, but then the funding stopped, so we had to move out. And uh, I think at the end, what you need is opportunities or maybe just occasions. I mean, in several, several things of several of the things we tried, we couldn't, we couldn't move forward just because there was no uptake, no interest. Uh, we couldn't get a, ho a good handle on the institutional, on, on the institutions of the water uh, distribution system, which was actually crucial, but it was very politically charged, so we couldn't get into that. And so there were some things we could simply not deal with, but still. I think we could achieve, uh, and we have achieved, a, a great deal. And, and maybe one final message is also: this was a 10-year project, and still the innovations are not yet, not yet, not there to be. You know, they're not outscaled yet. It's starting, but it's starting very slowly. And this is also maybe a lesson: projects of this kind and bringing innovations into an area takes takes a lot of time. And that's something we we should keep in mind. That's what I wanted to to say thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Christopher. So now the floor is open for questions, comments. Any questions, any comments? Yes, please. Thank you, Christopher, for a nice presentation. Uh, in your paper that you shared with, uh, to us about the relevant information from your story, it is mentioned about the water quality problem in, in the area, mm -hmm. uh, the high use of uh, DDT and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about this information? Has, the, has it any change in terms of the, the way of farmer uh, doing some practice in, the, in that particular area? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's an interesting point. Uh, um, DDT was widely used in, in the region uh, before in the Soviet uh, times, and there were still stocks. There, there were, f there were. It, it was delivered by planes onto the fields. So there were, there were these landing strips where, where all the DDT was stored and so on. They were basically toxic grounds, and we knew that in the beginning when we came there, people told us, uh, "Don't go there because it's, 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 it's full of DDT." 
DDT, they have run out of DDT simply, and it's now banned, but still there were some stocks, they used them up. And actually, you can buy DDT on the black market, but um, so it, there is some use, but it's much reduced simply on because of cost, cost reasons. Farmers nowadays, they have to, to be much more economical and then the, the former state uh, uh, farms. And so the, the use of pesticides has, has gone down enormously. And there were also, this is one, another one of these myths, uh, there, were, there is always this idea that the aral sea dried out, 90% of it is gone, so we have a very huge desert. And all the DDT was always flowing into that lake, so it should be somewhere on the sediment. And when you have these dust storms that come up, then they carry the DDT and, and intoxicate everybody in the region. Actually, we found that, and, and many people, many other studies found that it's not true. People are mostly suffering from dust, um, dust contamination in the air uh, 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 because it's just so dry and a dust storm raises a lot of, uh, of, of fine particles, but DDT as such is not a problem uh, anymore, not that strong. It was, uh, there, there were huge problems with um, maternity and, and childbirth and so on, but it's, it's now not so strong anymore. Okay, thank you, any other questions, comments? Yes, Christine, please. Thanks very much, and thank you for the talk. And I apologize, I didn't read your paper, so if I'm asking a question that would have been answered by the paper, forgive me. Um, you talk about sort of the complexity of integrated approaches and that you need to sort of proceed mm -hmm. simply. Um, but integrated approaches is what smallholder farmers do all the time. Um, and, but I assume, you know, so I don't, I don't think it's a difficulty with the farmers. I think often it's a difficulty with various institutions mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. of the state or you know, research mm -hmm. institutions or whatever. Um, I assume in this area, I mean, it was part of the Soviet Union, so I assume they went through long periods of, of um, a sort of destruction of smallholder mm -hmm. farmer economies, whether through collectivization or through the yeah. bringing in of these big... Um, um, industrial crop um, uh, production systems. So is there something left of smallholder systems? You know, is there, I mean, what did people do for a living and do some yeah. of them still do sort of more complex, integrated sort of things? Do they have yeah. more, more um, diverse economies at the smallholder level or at the village level? Mm -hmm. And my second question, totally, um, um, totally um, um, in, in, in keeping with almost every other question I've asked, uh, Central Asia, certainly uh, Tajikistan and all are mm. known as areas of fantastically high rates of migration and dependence on remittances. Is that now um, an issue in Uzbekistan as well? And, can, and does that actually sort of make the um, economy more, essentially more, um, more diverse as well? Thank you. Three very good points. Uh, you're right. Uh, f I mean, the f irrigation in that region is not dating back to the Soviet era. It's it's three or four thousand years old. These are areas that have been part of the Silk Road, so there were always little settlements and, and irrigation along the rivers for for many ma for millennia. So people, and that's actually part of, of an interesting story because people actually in that region where we worked, which is called Khorazm, which were, once was a very big autonomous state, now it's just a very small uh, uh, district or province of Uzbekistan. Uh, and there are wonderful cities like Khiva and, uh, and others where, where you have uh, old heritage sites from, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the Muslim era. And so, um, so these people have a lot of experience with irrigation, and it was it was hugely increased, of course, in these state farms. And when you had state farms, you had a tractor driver, you had a, a head of the farm, and, and several headmen, and so on. But you had a, a teacher, and you had this and this and that. And all these people, after independence, in many of these Central Asian country, countries, became actually small. These farms were dissolved, and people became small farmers. And so. The person trained as a tractor driver all of a sudden was a farmer. So there was not much of an experience. So much of it needed to be built up. And actually Uzbekistan had learned from that experience and at some time in 2008 they, they abolished the very, very small farms. In a little bit brutal manner, they just told people they had to merge or otherwise, uh, <laughs> otherwise do, do, we don't tell you. 
But um, so, but basically, that was probably a smart thing to do because the, some very small farms were just not viable. Um, they have a lot of, in, uh, I mean, besides the state ordered crops, they have a lot of small gardens where they produce a lot of wonderful vegetables. They have a wonderful uh, fruit culture. Uh, they have many varieties that, that can store for, for long periods in winter without cooling, just to be in the basement, dry and, and, and cool. So there is a lot of interesting stuff going on and, and, and a lot of original knowledge that should actually be harvested at some point and preserved. Um, so st smallholders are back. They, they, that's part of the poverty problem uh, because many of them are on farm so, and farms so small they, they can actually can't make a living. Um, and the last, so the last question was um, migration. Uh, migration. Yeah, there are many many Uzbek workers in the Soviet Union uh, working in, in construction, exporting stuff like melons and so on. And I don't have figures on what the part of remittance of the national budget is. Uzbekistan is economically a very strong country in, in a way. I mean that they rely on on cotton a lot, but they're also building up, at least the plan is to build up industry, they have gold. Uh, so remittances uh, don't play such a large role like in Tajikistan probably, but they certainly play a role. Yeah. Um, it, must, it must have gone down now with the, with, with the economic crisis also in, in Russia, but uh, there still is, is a, it's a very big part. And, and many families I talked to in, in this district where we were, they, they had somebody abroad or somebody working in the next big city and, and, and somebody working in Russia or whatever, Kazakhstan in the oil rigs and so on. <coughs> oil, not rigs, but the oil, oil production in Kazakhstan. Any other comments <coughs> or questions? Yes, Daniel. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, about the indigo, uh, what was the reason of introducing this species? Is it just to get rid of the government control in planting? Of what? Uh, of the? R to get of rid of the control of the government to uh, and, uh, cut no. them? No, um, because you can't get rid of it. I mean, the government tells you, it, it commands the, 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 the growth of cotton down to the hectare. So the government knows, I mean, some government, local government officials, they know exactly the land, they know this farmer owns this hectare, so you do cotton here and you do cotton there. And so you can't ex escape that. Um, but of course, people have their own land. And, and we, we were just experimenting with alternative crops for the situation that cotton, I mean, cotton is very strong depending on the world market. And, and so some diversification might be healthy and also healthy for the land for, for sustainability. And, and we try to find crops that could also grow on, on marginal, on, on salinized lands. On Sometimes you have remote areas where the irrigation water doesn't get so often, so it's, it's more drought uh, agriculture and so on. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what led to the choice of indigo, but um, there was some study on what would be suitable for, for local conditions, mm -hmm. and then where we would find a local market. Indigo currently comes mostly out of India. The process of extracting indigo is secret, and nobody can Nobody tells you what it is. We, we talk to many textile organizations in Germany. They, they all keep mum about this. So we tried to develop a very crude way of, of extracting it, which worked. Mm -hmm. And it can probably be refined. And so we thought that could give farmers a good market value for the, for, for the hectare. And, and so actually, if you have three hectares of cotton and half hectare of indigo, it might be a viable, a viable solution. So you know, you, can, you, you can't turn the system around, but you can maybe slowly build in more di diversification and, and, and you know, bring back the state order on, on, on land that is really not productive and so on. And so slowly, slowly introduce a change. That, that was the idea behind it. Any sign of being invasive? Sorry? Invasive? Um, well, nothing is really invasive that depends on irrigation. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, you're in the middle of big deserts and then you have these irrigated areas. So, uh, and I don't, we, it never came up. I don't think it was really, it, it would have been a problem. Any other comment? If not, I also have a, a question. Please. Uh, 
Okay, I, I will ask my own question, yeah. waiting. So when, when I read the, the abstract you sent, I found it, this is really an exciting experience. Mm -hmm. Because as you, you confirmed in your presentation, you try to figure out how to bring this integrative approach that an upscaling and outscaling can happen. And uh, as you said, one of them is very important is to make simple something which is complex, to find champion, and also to, to do capacity building. But at the same time, and also I like the idea of answering with bottom-up solutions, uh, top-down mistakes to yeah. find, like, yeah. getting from down to top. But at the same time, I think, if we want to, to take something from this experience, because what happens there is that first, some development decision maker killed diversity, they killed biodiversity, they introduced a system which was actually maladaptive for the region, and then now we are looking for solutions. And my question is, how can we integrate those approaches in a way that this will not happen? Mm. Before it happens that we are looking to yeah. solve the issue, is there any way to bring those approaches <coughs> before that, that we don't need to fix the symptom after, mm. after the maladapted decision-making happened? I mean, the, the, the maladaptation is there. You, 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 you can't not have it because it's there already. So you have to find a way of, of moving from that system into something else. And some other countries have made a very, very st st quick turnover, you know, abolished all the state order, gave, gave the land out, and, and so on. But that also created a lot of problems for farmers sometimes. So the Uzbek government, for several reasons, is following this more, let's say, top-down approach. And, but still they realize there are problems. Uh, they know there are problems. I mean, they, 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 they have half of the RLC, so if, you know, every second foreigner that's, that's coming along is telling them about the RLC, and they know it themselves. I mean, it's not that they, they ignore it. Uh, they just probably have different um, priorities right now. But so um, our idea was to, to demonstrate ways of, of improving the system that that are more rooted in evidence from what's actually going on locally and then build, build, build a case for these. So the conservation agriculture was a perfect example where we actually, in the beginning, we had a few fields where we did it on, our, on, on some state experimental farms which were, where we got some land. And then uh, we took farmers there and the farmers, oh yeah, that's great, we want to do this. And so that's how it actually started multiplying. And then there was a problem because the government doesn't allow you to not plow. Yeah? So conservation agriculture in parts re relies on plowing and, and, and the state order relies on very detailed instructions on when to plow, when to fertilize, when to irrigate and so on. It's by dates. Yeah? On 31st of May you do this, on, on 7th of June you do that. And so changing this system then of these, of these recommendations in order to be more flexible to, to, to introduce more uh, those technologies is, is a challenge in itself. Uh, one of these, and, and you know, it, it's, it works both ways because also the, the international recommendations are sometimes totally off course. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole question about the water, the irrigation, the over-irrigation. Farmers over-irrigate because they need to keep the plants watered because they lose the land if they don't produce the cotton they're supposed to produce. So that's when, that's why farm, uh, when a farmer gets water, he puts the water there and, and no matter what, whether it's salinizing the land, he doesn't care because he wants to keep the land. And so then World Bank came in and said, yeah, let's do water, let's do water pricing. Yeah? But farmers are too poor, you can't, you can't give them a water price, you can't install a water price that is actually covering the costs. So you have to have some water price that is ridiculous. Then, then what? Does it actually help? Then you have to measure the water in order to introduce a price. There is no water measuring in place. So you have to build all these little water control stations. And so there are a lot of, of problems that coming from such an idea. And at the end, you find that what basically the water pricing in that particular condition doesn't work. But maybe something else would work. Yeah? Uh, and, and so these are the, the ideas, we, and that's behind the, the myth debunking because it's not, I mean, it's fun and all that, but it also has a very serious background because many recommendations come, come from the outside and say, oh, you should do this. And, and then sometimes it's being done in order to show off, oh, we did it and we, 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 we can 
it can be paid for it, but it's not being done in, in a way that actually works, just to please the foreign donors, and that's not, not good. <coughs> Any other comment? We have like, yeah, I think we have one minute, or we start late, so. No, okay. Then thank you very much, Christopher, for this presentation and this interesting uh, discussion. And thank you for everybody for coming uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you.